everyone, and welcome back to this episode of Inlay Terms. I'm your host, Payman Ascari, and today with us we have uh, my my new friend, uh, Mr. Donald Best. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Payman. Great to be on the show. And uh, I see some of the things you have lined up for us to discuss. No doubt we'll go there and other places. It's, it's just kind of exciting. Uh, this is the first time I've been a guest on your show. <laughs> so, so you and I, we ran into each other on the, the Jason Levine show, and you're the co-host there. So you're, you're an expert in this field, and I'm, uh, I'm, just, I'm sweating bullets over here. <laughs> oh, I don't think I'm much of an expert, but you know, we get better, and the technology has improved. I mean, look at the mics we're using, the technology we're using. This stuff cost $10,000, 20000 20 years ago, I mean, to get what we're doing now. And it's, it's incredible. I love the fact that everybody in their basement, from their kitchen table, in their backyard, they can tell what they see, tell the stories in the news. Um, I think it's totally killing the mainstream media. Yeah, I agree. It's almost like a, a printing press 2.0 revolution on steroids. <laughs> it is. It is. And, uh, well, I, I, I can only think of... Uh, last August, when those fires were happening in British Columbia, many of them arsons, by the way, and uh, people were complaining that the police and the fire department and authorities wouldn't let them out of the fire zones, and CBC came on and said, oh, that's a lie, of course they will and everything. And then on came this lady holding her iPhone, and she just, you know, pointed the iPhone at the roadblock at the end of her street and then swung it around where the fire was coming at the other end of the street. And, uh, you know, she just proved, a citizen holding a phone, proved that the CBC and the government and everybody had just, whether they were lied or they had lied or were just mistaken, whatever it was, she just blew the mainstream news media right out of the water. And that happens all the time. So I, why don't we actually start there? Um, what is your, put yourself in the mindset of, let's take law enforcement. So why would they tell people you're not allowed to go and get your, like, why would they prevent them from going back into their homes? Like, what do you think was going through the minds of these RCMP officers? Well, they, they were preventing them from leaving their homes, from leaving where there was a, a, a danger zone is what they were doing. Because someone had told them to establish a roadblock, and they got their orders, so they established a roadblock. And maybe when it was established, that was there was a reason for it, to prevent people from going into whatever zone because there was a danger, or maybe houses were getting broken into because people left. Whatever it was, let's, let's presume that it was a reasonable thing to do. I'll give them that credit. But then when you see the the fire coming at the other end of the street, and now you're blocking people from leaving what is a danger zone for them, you've, you've just gone bananas. And it's this, it's this uh, robotic, like, do as we're told uh, mindset of police officers today who just don't seem to be able to think uh, with any common sense uh, th that is so dangerous. Because, uh, as I've said many times before, I hope that when I was a police officer and I first joined back in 1975, we were members of the community and there were Peelian principles. Sir Robert Peel invented modern policing back in the 1850s. And the idea is the community is the police, the police are the community, and the police are only doing full time what every citizen should be doing, which is looking out for everybody else. But somewhere we turned into, our police forces turned into an occupying army. And that was especially too when uh, COVID hit, in my opinion. Uh, it just triggered something. And what we had was police officers who were really weaponized weapons of, of the ruling class who would do what they were told without reference to the Charter of Rights, um, our Constitution, the law, the rule of law, and we saw that in the brutality that they that that the police administered. They just upped the levels to crazy levels, uh, and we saw that. And also, 
They chose political factions. <laughs> Excuse me. Individual police officers and police services and their command structure chose, for instance, to kneel with Black Lives Matter supporters in Toronto and Ottawa and, and uh, I think uh, Vancouver, uh, maybe Calgary too. So the police, the police personnel knelt with Black Lives Matter supporters who were violating the lockdown laws, but they knelt with them. Two weeks later in Toronto, the mounted unit um, took down Adamson Barbecue, trampled customers who were there who merely wanted to buy a barbecue sandwich. They went in with, with, um, they went in with all this force and this attitude, but they let the Black Lives Matter guys go, those protesters, but not these ones buying a sandwich from Adam Skelly. And so they killed 100 jobs. And don't forget, we had Costco open on one side of, of uh, Adamson Barbecue and Walmart on the other and the liquor store across the street. But not, we couldn't let some, you know, some guy sell sandwiches. That's crazy. It's also totally against the rule of law. But our police forces did that. They did it all across the country. And I find that very concerning. I like where this episode's going. <laughs> so I did not know that you were a law enforcement officer. I, I want to dig in a little bit deeper. What's changed structurally or what's changed in people's minds where you said it was uh, law enforcement for the people of the people serving the community to now where they're just blindly following orders. Like what, what do you think is the fundamental thing that's changed? Well, that is the change, but what are the causes? And I think there's a number of causes. Uh, first of all, society has gotten a lot more violent. It, it really has. Look, I've carried, I carried several of my comrades, my dead comrades, went to all sorts of funerals. I, th I I think I went to like 10 police funerals before I was 25 years old. And um, I've loaded a dead friend into an ambulance. So, so that was back in 75 to 80, 85. Things started to get really wild in the mid 80s and then going to 90, the violence ramped up. So that makes police officers fearful. And when armed people are fearful, sometimes they have that, that saying, I'd rather be carried by 12 or uh, uh, judged by, judge by 12 than carried by six. I don't know if you ever heard that, but that's a typical cop saying, uh, I'd rather be judged by 12, a jury, than carried by six at my funeral. Well, that's all well and good, but sometimes... Sometimes that makes for some brutality. So we have general levels of violence uh, escalating. And we have different people now, too. And, and society has changed. I first worked with a, a woman as a police officer, a, a female police officer. I think it was about 1976, 1977. I would have been about 23 years old. It was all I could do to not open the door for her. Because ever since I was little, my mom told me, you open the doors for women. You open the car doors for women. When a woman stand, comes into the, the room, you stand up. On the bus, you offer your seat to a woman. This is what men do. This is, we protect women and children. And this is what I was taught to, and my entire generation was taught that. So we would have a bar fight. And you go into a bar fight, and it didn't matter. There was pool cues flying and blood all over the place. And we'd walk in there ready to, ready to rock because, well, sometimes you have to. And the bar would see that I had a female partner with me. To a man, 
even motorcycle gangsters, dropped those pool cues, put down their fist, stood back, had their head in shame, because that was our generation. You're going to fight in front of a woman? You, what are you going to do, hit a woman? Right? So it's, it's just, it's just, that was the way it was. <clears throat> Within 10 years, that had totally changed. Now, also because we have many newcomers to Canada that come from societies that do not respect women, view them as lesser. Sometimes it's even codified in law, certainly codified in, in, in their cultures. And, and we have this coming to Canada. And these people, they're in the bars now. So what happens in 1990 when a woman, walked, a woman police officer walked into a bar? Big change from 15 years before. Nobody would stop fighting. And they'd, they'd come over and they'd try and hit the police officer, the woman. That's a huge societal change. It also meant for the police officers that where before a woman's presence would calm things down, now it only means you're vulnerable because you've got to protect your butt and hers too because she's only 110 pounds. And you say, well, she's armed and everything. Well, no one's going to pull out a gun and shoot anybody in a bar fight. Shouldn't anyway. So that was a huge societal change, but it brought about a change in policing. So, you know, you asked me, what changed everything? And then I think that we have um, the government and governments at all level have for many, many years tried to make the population unquestioningly obedient. Now, there are certain narratives, certain agendas, political agendas, left agendas, like the Black Lives Matter. You could do what you wanted. You could tear down statues. You could burn over 100 Christian churches from one end of Canada to the other uh, because there was a myth, uh, a falsehood spread, that there was a mass grave in one school. So they burned 100 churches down, and some of our government even said, well, you shouldn't do that, but you can understand why. Thus, thus uh, you know, keep fanning those flames. So a number of different things, and I'm going all over the place here because it really does illustrate that it's been a long, long social war. This is a social war. It's, it's a change, and it's been happening, and there are so many factors. Um, so, so this is part of what's happened to policing because policing are ordinary people. So those things have led us that way, but there's also a leadership issue, and that's huge because we now have police leaders, chiefs of police, senior officers engaging in politics. May, for instance, um, that mass murder in Nova Scotia where uh, the culprit dressed like an RCMP officer and had a fake RCMP car, killed a police officer or two and, and many other people. That was a mass homicide investigation. And right in the middle of that, the RCMP commissioner, Brenda Lucky, who was appointed by Trudeau, interfered with that investigation. And we're very grateful that those homicide investigators had the presence of mind to record the conversation where she wanted the homicide investigators to reveal to the press the weapons that were used and seized. Don't forget, this is very early in the investigation. And she wanted that so that the government could further its anti-gun agenda. That's just about, she said it, just about like that. Now, in the middle of a homicide investigation, you don't let people know what guns were seized and where. They may have come from someplace. Maybe someone who supplied the guns would now be able to hide something. You just don't do it. But we had the senior officer, the command officer of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, 
despicably, corruptly interfering with a police investigation for a political purpose to support the ruling class, her, her, her prime minister. That happens all the time. And that is a huge reason why the police have become an occupying army, because the leadership has failed to uphold their oath of office, the rule of law, and the Constitution, the Charter of Rights, everything that we have that we've established as a foundation for how we run this country. The police leadership and everyone else have just ignored that. I think that's, that's a huge part of that. Thank you. That was, that was a very, uh, very good, comprehensive answer. Uh, Donald, you, know, you, you mentioned the rule of law. Um, so the name of the show is In Lay Terms. I'm, I'm trying to take things and simplify them as much as possible. You can take as much time as you want to answer this, but what does that word mean to you, the rule of law? The rule of law is a legal concept, and uh, you know you can, you can look it up. The, the short form is this. It doesn't matter whether you're rich, poor, black, white, female, male, homosexual, uh, you know, live on the West Coast or the East Coast. The rule of law means that the law applies to everyone equally. It means there are no special classes, no favors, no protected classes. It means that, that citizens expect and have the right to expect to be treated the same in any situation, no matter who they are. And I can tell you, rule of law is absolutely dead, killed, murdered by the police, by the courts, and by the, the governments at all level. We no longer have rule of law. When, when the police or the government target certain groups while letting other groups and individuals uh, go free or experience lesser penalties or, or, or maybe get a caution instead of being arrested based on skin color, history, uh, wealth, power. I mean, the, that's not rule of law. That's, that's a total corruption, destruction of rule of law. Now, in India, uh, and I'm very familiar with policing in India, an ordinary police officer, before conducting an investigation that's anything unusual at all, has to go to their superiors and get permission to do that investigation because, well, that business that that officer wants to investigate might be owned by a rich person who gives the politicians money, or it might be a relative of someone in the police service. Or maybe they're just a very protected, powerful person. And so decisions to do an investigation to enforce the law are based on class, they're based on race, they're based on religion, money. And that's not rule of law. That is a totally corrupt system. And I'm sorry to tell you, that's exactly what we have in Canada right now. I could talk for hours on that. Um, on the same line, uh, I wanted to touch on immigration and how it uh, intersects the police department. But let me let me tee this up. They're trying to pass Bill 63, with, which is a censorship law, but which essentially creates a, another kangaroo court to stand beside the Human Rights Tribunal. And they specifically say that it's open for citizens and immigrants, like permanent residents. I find that alarming, and I think you and I agree with this, but like, can you tie that, just the whole concept of letting non-citizens enter into these law enforcement fields? Like, what do you, what, What's your view on that? Well, first of all, in Canada, most police services um, in cities and in provinces, and even the RCMP, if I recall correctly, you don't have to be a citizen to join 
to be employed by the police service. And I'm talking about civilian. Let's, let's make that clear. Just civilian. Okay. And what this means is that any, uh, any immigrant who has permanent residency status, whether they intend to be in Canada or not, they're allowed to be hired by the police service, access confidential information. Every police service employee, I'm, I'm not talking officers here, I'm talking, I'm talking janitors, okay? Janitors who are allowed to go into a room and clean and they have, uh, and, and such, and they're not citizens. That's bad enough. But when we have non-citizens as sworn officers having power and authority over citizens, well, now you've really crossed a line. And when I think that the Ottawa police, for instance, um, some of those police officers in uniform that were so brutal with the convoy protesters may not be citizens. And you know, the authority, the administration, they like non-citizens. And I know this sounds wild. It really does. It sounds wild. But I'm going to go back to Tiananmen Square. When the Chinese authorities were faced with thousands of young people protesting, wanting democracy, uh, there's, there's several, you know, interpretations of what they wanted. And I understand all that. They ordered, the Chinese authorities ordered the local army to go in and brutalize and do everything that was done. The units refused. And they refused because they're, you know, these are their, their, their relatives, these are, are their family, these are their friends, these are the people that they went to university with. So the local command, the local armed forces, refused. What happened? It took three or four days for the Chinese, the communist Chinese government, to bring in outsiders. Why? Because the outsiders will do things that the locals will not do. Same in Canada. We had all sorts of outsiders, not from Ottawa, uh, as police officers that came in. The Toronto Police Mounted Unit that trampled uh, those people waiting for barbecue sandwiches at Adamson's Barbecue, they are the ones, not the RCMP, who trampled that that uh, elderly woman in a walker. You've probably seen the video and see, seen the, uh, the shots. They're the one who did that. They're the ones who did that. And the Ottawa police, a large proportion of them were not involved in the clearing and clearing out of, of uh, uh, the protesters after the Emergency Act was declared. They had the RCMP do that, the OPP do that, uh, outside of town, police forces do that. Why? Because, generally speaking, you won't brutalize, as a police officer, the people you live with, the people you shop with, the people who are your neighbors. You won't do that. Now, that goes into why the ruling class have no problem at all with arming foreigners. Foreigners, they're foreigners. They, you know, they, they arrive here. Uh, they, they have no problem at all arming foreigners who are not citizens, who haven't even been in the country long enough to get citizenship. They have no problem with arming them and training them to be violent in the armed forces. They have no problem with... Uh, arming them and uh, uh, training them how to do control of citizens in the police services. They have no problem at all giving foreigners authority and power over Canadian citizens because they are more likely to obey 
and do exactly what they were told. And that's the reality, unfortunately, with allowing foreigners, non-citizens, recent immigrants to have positions of power, authority, and be licensed by the state to commit violence. That's the problem. I want to uh, switch to another, it was related to what you just said, but the concept of protesting, uh, I noticed with the, the Freedom Convoy, uh, the CBC does this all the time. Like they, they craft the argument so they've already won when you step in to argue with them. And it, I, I guess my question is, like to you, what is the purpose of protesting? Because essentially this whole exercise was... Uh, the, the government telling people you should not protest. Protests should never exist. <clears throat> yes, and they... But at the same time they were doing that, first of all, they changed the law in Ontario to make it illegal to protest with a vehicle. Okay, so don't forget we have all levels of government involved in this who, who seem to think that they are our masters. And so, so they did that. But you say protests aren't allowed. That's not true at all. Protests are allowed when they are approved, when they assist our rulers, when they are, uh, uh, when they back up uh, government policy at all levels. The recent pro-Palestine protests are a great example of that where we, we have basically uh, people doing acts of violence, shutting down roads. It's been going on for months. Nothing is done. Nothing is really done. And they, you know, it is, it is a certainty that they're handling the, these people with kid gloves. In Toronto, the cops brought coffee to the protesters. You know, uh, but throw up a couple of bouncy castles, and they'll beat you. You know, I'm, 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 this, this doesn't work. This just doesn't work. Black Lives Matter again, and tearing down of statues, and burning churches, and uh, all of that. It's all approved. But if you really want to talk about your rights, if you want to talk about the Nuremberg Laws, where... Uh, where people who are involved in any medical experiment or, or any medical treatment at all have the right to be fully informed and to refuse and to have bodily autonomy, you're the enemy. And they'll shut you down and they'll beat you on the street. But wasn't it interesting that within days of the protests and weeks uh the governments at all levels started to back off. And I think that the, that the Freedom Convoy in, in January and February of 2022 was successful and that it really caused people in government and the ruling class to back off what they were doing. And uh, don't get me wrong, they, they're, still, you know, they're still in a war against that against uh, citizens you know, standing up for their rights and demanding that the law be fulfilled. And they're, they're still against that. But they had to take, they had to stop what they were doing. So that citizen protest was successful. That said, we're still seeing the vestiges of it today with uh, all of the political prisoners, whether they're, they're in jail uh, now still, uh, as with the, Coots, uh, with the Coots 4 out west, or whether they've just been charged and ruined. The other thing that happened, and, and this was a, a terrible tyranny and a tragedy for so many Canadians, but we're so happy it happened because because this showed us all what the future is if we allow it. And that is the seizing of bank accounts, shutting down of credit, 
destroying of mortgages and homes and families with no due process, no court order, nothing. The, the, the government, the tyrannical government just said, do it. And some of the banks and financial institutions jumped in and uh, were just so eager that they were, they were like the, I don't know, the Stasi from East Berlin. And they reported on Canadians and, and we had people reporting on their neighbors. Oh, they gave 50 bucks for the convoy, for fuel, or whatever. And so we saw the government try and use, try and shut down the finances of its political opponents. And that brings us to Bill C-63. Because if you think that the government, after, after putting that hate, crime legislation in place for the children, of course, for the children. Yeah. If you think that they're not going to use that against political opponents, you're an absolute idiot. Not you. I believe you probably, probably know Payman, but you know, anybody who, who, who looks at Bill 63 and says, oh, we can trust the government. We can trust the courts. Where the heck have you been for four years? That's my point. I'm going to pick up on your uh, the comment on the bank freezes. So I'm just going to put it on the, um, under the umbrella of the erosion of property rights. Growing up in Canada, uh, did you see, how have you seen this steady erosion of property rights? I'll give you an example with zoning or, you know, with pet licenses, vehicle licenses, um, seatbelt laws, all, all these like little things. Do you think... They've had it happen incrementally over time. Do you think it ramped up at some point, or do you think I'm completely wrong and it's something else? I think you're absolutely right, and I think it's been a uh, a long process, a slippery a slope process, where we have a Marxist con, uh, Marxist uh, uh, philosophy and ideology being introduced in the educational system, in in schools, uh, in government, and of course that's all about. Uh, that's all about group property and group rights, not individual rights. And when we look at property rights today in Canada, well, let's talk about that. If you don't pay your, your property tax, what happens to it? What happens to your property? Well, it's seized, seized by government, and they'll sell it off. So do you really own that land? Do you really own that home? Do you really own that that? piece of real estate? The answer is no, you don't. And if you think you can just set up camp on Crown land, which a lot of people are doing now, and there are hidden communities throughout, throughout Ontario's Northland that I, I'm aware of, uh, some, some quite well constructed, and, but they're on Crown land, and when they find out, well, they move them, and, and it's this cat and mouse game. So... The entire system is designed to remove your property now. When you look at um, not only property taxes, but the level of taxation that we have in this country, and I, really, I, I'm hard pressed to, to say what it is, but you know, if you make, uh, make $30,000 a year, not much, or 40,000, not much. How much of that goes to your property tax? Well, if you live in Cochrane, Ontario, maybe uh, $7,000 in property taxes for your home every year. Well, hold it, that's a fifth or a fourth of, of, of some people's income. And now you have to heat it, but wait, there's carbon tax. And, and what used to be a, a $55 natural gas bill is now $200. It's all taxes. And you go to fill up your car or truck with diesel or gas, and how much of that is tax? So, you know, I've seen all sorts of estimates, but basically, Canadians have turned into tax slaves. And you go, oh, don't be hyperbolic. Come on. Well, do you know that Roman slaves had a taxation of 20%? Wouldn't you love to just have 20% of your income and everything you made 
be the tax level for everything? Wouldn't that be great payment? <laughs> it would be a lot less than what we have right now. Yeah. And now, you know, um, a, a pound of butter, seven, eight, nine dollars? Are you out of your mind? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, can, can, this is just, there's no need for that. Where I con contrast now, uh, in Thailand, in Cambodia, Laos, even in Singapore, which is supposed to be an expensive place, and, and I've been to, uh, the price of food, look, in, um, in Thailand, you go up by the side of the road and have a nice plate of, let's say, fried rice and chicken and a beer, and it's two bucks Canadian. And everybody's happy. They're making enough money. It, it, it's a it's a culture here to let people earn the living. Let them let them work. Uh, almost thirty years ago, when I arrived in Thailand, I was I was down in Bangkok, and it just shows you the the difference in culture here. So we're driving around the city, and my guide is there. And I point out, and we come to a, a railroad intersection, and people are breaking up the concrete with mallets and and uh, spikes, all hand. And and I said, my goodness, I mean, this whole job could be done in an hour with a pneumatic hammer. And my guide looked at me and he said, we have pneumatic hammers. But if we put a pneumatic hammer on this road, on this job, 12 families are going to be out of work. So it's more important that we let people have their lives and be able to make a living and care for their families than we save money and be efficient. Because efficiency would create 10 people out of work and only two people working on this job instead of the 12 or 15 that there was there. That's a societal attitude that people matter. People matter much more than big corporations. People matter much more than, than, than they're as individuals than this group rights thing, uh, you know, which leads to so much oppression. I love that about this society. And I, I wish, I know that we had that. I know we had that back in the 50s and 60s when I was growing up. We had something like that. Because there was no government support for anything. If there was a widow down the street, if there was a man who, who got injured at work, the neighbors did step in and they did care for people. And that's all gone now because the state has taken over. Uh, heck, we don't even have to have, uh, we don't even have to get married anymore. We don't have to have a husband. Uh, the state will become the husband and pay everything. And that leads to where we are in Canada. So, I don't know, that's just one of my observations about Thailand. You had asked earlier about what I see here in Thailand, and I see a great cultural difference that I just love compared with Canada. Because Canada is not the Canada that I grew up with where people would look after each other. Okay, then let, let's skip ahead to my, I guess this would have been my final question. Uh, on the Jason Levine show, you were talking about, you, you got kind of a fascinating life. Like you were, um, you were, you were a fun, fun young adult. And a, as I understand it, you, you had a pilot's license, maybe you had your own airplane. And then you, you just, you said how you got married and as soon as you had kids, you kind of, it just shocked you into being responsible. Walk us through all of those experiences, how they shaped your life and how from there you ended up in either permanently or temporarily in Thailand now. Okay. So first of all, I was born in Hamilton, Ontario. My father was a mechanic. He owned a garage, but it was a very poor garage. There was no hoist. He had to roll around on a concrete floor 
on a on a ruler and uh, on a little uh, mechanics crawler they called it. Uh, and my mom was a, a farm girl from out in Saskatchewan. My, my family has been in Canada since uh, the early 1700s, various branches of it. So we've been around, and there's even a, a, a branch uh, on my grandfather's side, um, on my maternal grandfather's side, uh, Branscombe, where we were United Empire Loyalists. We were uh, Americans who decided we wouldn't rebel against the king. We left everything, lost everything during the American Revolution, came to Canada, to New Brunswick, and, and started all over again as United Empire Loyalists. And as a matter of fact, I and, and my, my children and grandchildren, uh, by royal decree, are allowed to use the uh, suffix U-E for United Empire Loyalists. So I can, I can actually write my name as Donald Best U-E. That's by royal decree. That and two bucks will get you a cup of coffee. But uh, it, but in any event, so so that was my my background. Um, on my tenth birthday, I got a set of mechanics overalls, and it was expected that I would go help out in the family garage on Fridays and Saturdays, and that really shaped me a lot working with my dad, and it also shaped me because the the, the garage was very much a guy's environment. And so you, you had that culture of guys hanging out together and teaching the young, the young men, or the young boys, in, in my case, to start, what life was about, how to work with others, how, how to behave in society. And once again, that you should respect women and all the rest of that. That, that was that culture that was passed on there. So... Um, I did pretty well, and by the time I was 16, I was uh, I had my initial pilot's license. 17, I, I had my full pilot's license. I ended up buying an airplane. Uh, I had lots of fun, brand new pickup truck, maybe a few girlfriends, and uh, then so that was me at at 20, and at 21. I heard an advertisement for the Toronto Police, and I thought, you know, I could do that for a couple of years, get some steady income, and uh, then I'll decide what I'm going to do. So I liked it, and I found it. It was, I found that that it gave me motivation, that I felt fulfilled, that it was helping people. I was working with a good group of guys and girls. And I was, you know, when I think of myself at 21 years old, how immature I was, but I had this badge and my gun, and of the two, the badge was far more, uh, far more powerful. That gave me authority over Canadian citizens who were two and three times my age. <laughs> Excuse me who probably looked at me like some kid, and I was. But within a year after that, the new pickup truck was gone, replaced by a used Pinto station wagon. The airplane was gone, and uh, my pregnant wife was sitting beside me. Wow, what a change. And I sort of woke up and went, how, how the heck did that happen? But this is what you're expected to do. And so I did it. And so I raised a family. I dug into my job and, and did well there. And it was the societal expectations and my own expectations that matured me and made me responsible enough that at 22 years old, I had a mortgage, a wife, a job, and, and I was a responsible member of society. I didn't live in my mom's basement till I was 40 years old. Um, 
we how have we gone from there and that was that was the typical story of 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 young people back then it really was the typical story of all classes and all of a sudden we as a society stopped supporting marriage stopped subsidizing it stopped uh stopped really making it an important step i've heard there's 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 three steps to success in our society in western society and and they make sense to me and uh None other than than the uh, head of the Ontario Civil Rights uh, uh, or Human Rights uh, Tribunal when he was lecturing us back in back in police college about seventy six seventy seven, and he came in and he said, you know, there are three steps uh, to success in this society, and the one is finish high school. Finish high school. Number two, get a full-time job. It doesn't matter what full-time job you have. Get a full-time job, whether it's the lowest of the low job, get a full-time job. It gets you a start. It, it makes you see how the world is working, allows you to get along with people, to build experience in a job record. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Get a full-time job. And number three, don't have children unless you're married. Huge one. Well, you know, um, I think those are still good, really viable foundations for for any young person. But look how our society has has turned that all around. Okay, uh, finish high school. You don't have to finish high school. As a matter of fact, we've lowered we've lowered the standards so much that when I had a business and I was, I was seeking to employ people, and I've had several, first thing I would ask was, did you graduate high school? And the second was, can you read and write? And I'd give them some math problems, and usually that took care of about 90% of the applicants. I'm, I'm talking in the, in the 90s, probably worse now. So the educational has changed from uh, performance to social indoctrination by the left. I think we probably agree with that, that the, that the educational uh, foundations are, are missing. So they took away the education. Full-time job? Well, um, we've exported all our manufacturing jobs to uh, overseas, and that was done long-term basis by politicians and business people who are traitors to Canada. Up until the mid-70s, one man, yes, a man, could hold a job at National Steel Car or Ford or Westinghouse or something like that, and he could put wheels on cars or weld a frame or whatever he was doing, put together transmissions of washing machines at Westinghouse. I did that. And uh, so one man could do that, have a used car, and buy a small three-bedroom bungalow so that his wife could stay at home and raise the children. That was still possible in the 70s. That's been taken from us. Those jobs are gone. Um, they're, they're, just, they're gone now. So that was a deliberate action to enhance corporate profits by the people who have been the ruling class for the last 30, 40 years. It's really taken that long. And as far as don't have children out of, uh, out of wedlock, now that's, that's celebrated and subsidized by government. And you get more of whatever you subsidize. So just like with the, with the drug addictions, uh, we have safe supply chains now. You know, um, we'll give you your drugs. And we have more drug addiction and more homelessness. And, it, I, I mean, what has become with this country in the last 30, 40 years? Well, maybe the question is, how do we get it back? 
I mean, payment, how do you see this? How old were you when you first came to Canada? Man, I, uh, my memory is horrible. So I, I was born in 83, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I got here in 89, so I must have been six. Um, when I got here in, in 89, Canada was still, there were still some remnants of Canada. Like I remember they used to teach us square dancing in grade two. Um, I used, uh, I, I, something, something got stuck in my fingers, like glue, glue and I, I said, oh God. And the teachers yelled at me. She said, "You know, don't take the Lord's name in vain." Um, it, it was still. It was very much disciplined. I, I, I'm guessing a, uh, about ten years after that, everything failed. I think that's a fair statement. Um, there was a transition there, but it just didn't happen in education. It happened throughout society, and we're fighting these these battles. And those of us who, who know that we want a different society than we're being offered now, they're doing everything they can to restrict our information to each other, to restrict what we say, to uh, penalize us and vilify us for our opinions. Um, I was, uh, pardon me, I have to have a cough candy, so people probably hear that, but... Anyway, um, for seven years, I wrote an article that was, uh, I wrote an article in 2016, and for seven years, it was the top article at the University of Windsor Law School uh, self-represented litigants project. And I know that because it was in their annual reports and it was also, uh, they did a nice video for me when I, I was a, uh, the sole recipient of the 2018 Ontario Civil Liberties Award. And the director of that project at the law school came on and made a nice speech and said nice things about me. And that, that, that was very nice. Um, but last year, when I wrote an article interviewing Lois Cardinal, Lois Cardinal is a transsexual woman. In other words, born a man. And his story is, at 14, 13 years old, he became captured by the trans-industrial complex. And by 20, he had chopped off all his, all his privates and found out that he'd been lied to. And now he wants to end it all with medical assistance in dying, state suicide, because they they don't offer uh, they don't offer any care for his particular physical condition. So he wants to kill himself. But he says until he does that, he's going to fight to make sure that the that the children are and young adults are safe from the predatory trans cult that ruined my life. That, that's one of his quotes. I published that article, and within days, the University of Windsor Law School unpublished everything I'd ever written, canceled me, and wouldn't even reply to my emails or phone calls anymore. So, and I was heavily involved with the with the National Self-Represented Litigants Project for years. I even fundraised for them. And I, I up till, I think about 2018, 2019, maybe even till now, I was responsible for the largest single private donation to that project. I, I had arranged for that, and I, I, I uh, played a part in, in attracting that uh, donation to that project, who, who did some great work. But it didn't matter. They are so committed to this trans agenda to sterilize and mutilate children and young people and vulnerable young people that the minute I wrote something against that, they kicked me off their website, their number one article, they took it down, and they canceled me. So that's a, that's a destructive ideology. And 
We're seeing this all over, where if Canadians don't follow whatever the narrative is, whatever the, the agenda is, we're canceled. They fire us. They seize our bank accounts. Um, they harass us. Maybe our family, too. So this is not the country, I think, that you arrived in back in the <laughs> no. 80s. No, I don't think so. So there you go. But now, you know, some people are, oh, just an old guy on a rant. Well, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of people who are much younger than I am who know exactly of what I speak. And um, we're just seeing... We're, we're seeing a struggle right now for which side will win. And it really is good versus evil, as far as I'm concerned. Um, can I talk about the case of Ottawa Police Detective Helen Groose? This is your show? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's your it show. <laughs> you know your audience. Um, yeah. But uh, in any event, Detective Helen Groose, Ottawa Police Detective Helen Groose, 20 years of service, exemplary career, award-winning, wonderful. But in, by January of 2022, she was having real doubts about the mRNA jabs and whether they were... Uh, having an impact in a cluster of sudden infant deaths. So she started to investigate that. Now, uh, <clears throat> she discovered, and we've heard in testimony, because this uh, case has been going for uh, almost two years now, and there have been hearings, and, and I've attended uh, just about everyone. And so we've heard in testimony that detective groups discovered that the sudden infant deaths were not being properly investigated by the Ottawa police, by her squad, which was the squad, the uh, uh, sexual assault and child abuse squad. They are responsible for investigating sudden infant deaths that do not happen in hospitals. And she discovered that her colleagues were not investigating these deaths properly because there are standards, and there's even a World Health Organization standard, that the vaccine, uh, the vaccine status of the parents, not just the mother, but the parents, uh, is to be inquired about. That's part of the investigative procedure. So she found that was not happening. Within a few days, somebody complained about her. She was suspended for doing this, quote, unauthorized investigation. And in fact, there's no such thing as a police officer doing an unauthorized investigation. We have set up our police officers and law enforcement in this country, to, the, to now anyway, that any police officer can investigate anything at all. Don't have to ask for permission. Our badge and our oath gives us all the permission we need and the authority to investigate everything, from parking tags to murder. You don't need permission. And we've set it up that way to avoid the corruption that we see in countries like India and some other countries where the police have to are, are directed politically. And anything they do, they have to get political permission. So... What happened was Detective Groose was charged with doing this uh, unauthorized investigation. It's a bogus charge. But what it's about is this. The central question here is not about the vaccines. It really isn't. The central question of Detective Groose and the trial that's, that, that's still happening is this. Do Canadian police officers still have the authority to initiate any investigation without permission and without begging the political class to see if it's, you know, they're interfering with the political class or rich people? That's what Detective Gruse's charges are all about now. Because what's happening is the ruling class are trying to take control of police officers 
to ensure that police officers and law enforcement organizations are politically directed. And the charges against detective groups are to deter her and any other police officer in Canada from investigating, launching a criminal investigation into anything to do with the procurement, the approval, the mandating of these vaccines, uh, whether there were people harmed or killed. This is all designed from top down to prevent police officers from investigating those very subjects. And part of uh, my uh, website, donaldbest.ca, donaldbest.ca, it has a tab up the top about the Detective Groove story, uh, and you'll see everything I've written and some other p- things that people have written, and it's all there. And one of the things you'll be able to see is that I proved with evidence that the Public Health Agency of Canada personnel interfered with the police investigation, attempted to influence it prior to Detective Bruce being charged and even after she was charged. Very high up people in the Public Health Agency of Canada. And there's uh, recordings of uh, telephone calls that I secretly made while talking to those personnel. That's all there. So once again, back to the central theme of Detective Helen Groose and the charge. Yes, it's about she wanted to investigate to see if there was a potential connection between the vax and a cluster of sudden infant deaths unexplained. She wanted to see if that was there. But what it's turning into is this. Will the political class have the right to direct police operations and police investigations? Or will individual police officers still have the autonomy to uphold the law according to their oath of office? That's what it's all about. Uh, If I can uh, uh, recapture what you said, I think you're describing the erosion of the guardrails that prevent obstruction of justice. <laughs> That's what's happening. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we we now have a, a national police service, national police force, the RCMP, who have been presented with criminal offenses by members of parliament, including our prime minister, and have backed away from from doing anything about them. And we we have uh, the RCMP who backed away from investigating uh, interference, election interference. All of this, uh, be, why? Because they are de facto the law enforcement arm of the Liberal Party of Canada. And even if we get a new government in there, they will unless they change, still be the law enforcement arm of the ruling class. And that's so dangerous, so very dangerous. In the uh, Coots 4 trial that is now uh, now being held, or coming up anyway, and there's the Coots 3 and the Coots 4. Well, the Coots 4 are the ones who, two of them are still in prison now, some 700 and some odd days after, with no trial, and uh, often in solitary confinement. So I did an analysis of the press conference that the RCMP gave on February 14th, 2022, which was used by the federal government of Canada to proclaim the Emergencies Act. And once again, let's compare it with what happened when Commissioner Lucky, Brenda Lucky, tried to interfere with a homicide investigation in uh, Nova Scotia, she was told, butt out. They recorded her, and um, the officers wouldn't have it. In Alberta, though, the RCMP placed all the weapons uh, that they had seized. Well, they're, they're rifles, they're firearms like you'll find in any pickup truck in, in, in Alberta. 
So they place those rifles and shotguns and one lawfully owned pistol on the table, and you can see it. They didn't protect them for fingerprints. They didn't protect them for um, cross-contamination of DNA. And they tried to tell us that there were this group of terrorists across Canada that were directing things there. But they allowed themselves to be used for a political purpose, even at the expense of the professional investigation, which there wasn't. But see the contrast between the two groups of RCMP officers. One, we had committing a political act, and the other refused. But unfortunately, that refusal is very rare these days in law enforcement in Canada. Well, uh, Mr. Best, we're, we're coming to the end of the show, and I, I like to always end on a positive note on to give Canadians hope. So focusing on just this issue of... Um, obstruction of justice, law enforcement, and this, this Marxist creep. Like, what advice do you have for Canadians to stay positive and to recapture and regain their country? Well, I think, first of all, we're only three months into the new year, and look at the victories we've had. Look at the court decisions uh, that proclaimed the Emergency Act was, was, uh, was illegal. Look at the lawsuits that have been filed. The prime minister himself and other people are being personally sued, and that's before the court. It'll take a while, but it's happening. And we're seeing great truths exposed, and also we're seeing people in positions of power and authority finally having to acknowledge that the lockdowns were bad, were harmful, that there's a problem with uh, the, these vaccines, that they were experimental, that they were put on us, that uh, people did fraud uh, during the lockdowns. Uh, government government people, uh, you know, awarded themselves contracts and, and all the rest of that. All of this is tremendously positive, and we are only three months into the year. We're going to have the National Citizens Inquiry doing more hearings, I think, starting in, in, in May in Saskatchewan. So all of these things are very positive. But most of all, I say to Canadians, we must not comply. We know what they want to do now. We know that these tyrants seize bank accounts. We know that they impose uh, and coerce people to take these experimental drugs that have harmed people. And we know that they made tremendous profits. And all of that was foundationally able to be done because Canadians complied. We must not comply. We must peaceably, lawfully not comply because there are good things happening. And I think that the year of 2024 will be a good year to bring some accountability uh, to, to these people, who these tyrants who, who did this. But this is being fought on many fronts. And I think that each one of us have to participate somehow as best as we can. I know that there are many of you out there, you're, you're young and you've got mortgages and children, and uh, you're, in a different, you're in a different position than I am with no children. Mine are all adults, and, and I'm at this stage of life. But those who are standing up, who are able to stand up for all of us and have that integrity and they have the courage and the ability to do so, we must continue to do so. And that goes for you too, Payman. Just having this show is what you are doing. And me just talking and, and trying, to, trying to give my position on, on all of these things uh, that matter, that are the destruction that's happening in our society. 
whatever we're doing, whatever we can do, we must do it. That's it. Uh, great advice. Um, Donald, I, I wanted to thank you for uh, giving us your time and coming on the show. I know it's quite late over there in uh, Thailand. Um, so I, I wish you all the best and uh, look forward to having you back on the show at some point. I'd love to do that. And I'm sure we'll see each other again on Jason's show sometime too. Hopefully. Uh, good night and goodbye. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs>